Hey, what's up, guys? Lucas Burnley here with my co-host, TJ Schwartz. You are listening to the Edge and Flow podcast. Um, Got a couple more this year. And right now, TJ are kind of in the middle of two similar yet like divergent processes. Um, I have a drop uh, that is live as we're recording this. So I'm slightly nervous and TJ, you just finished or are in the process of a pre-order where are you Correct. at with that? It's, it's open right now. Okay. So it's open. Yeah. Um, so where do, where do you want to start with this, man? Because th- these are two, these are two like pretty different ways of selling that are very common, um, in our industry and there's pros and cons wrapped all up in both of them. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Where do you want to start? Well, I mean, just generally a conversation about like, okay, so you can make a product. We've talked yep. a lot about that. How do you sell it? And, not, and we're not talking about how do you market it per se, even though that ties into that, but like the actual transaction of a customer handing you money and you giving them the knife, yep. that can actually be structured in probably a hundred different ways. So, <laughs> so many ways. It's such a big thing to to talk about. So I'm excited. Right. Okay. So maybe maybe if we do like bullet points kind of around both. So, okay. Pre-order just off the top of my head. One of the great things is you can judge demand and you can plan finances around what you actually have to build with some type of, uh, resource going into it. If you're Mm -hmm. taking a deposit, right? Mm -hmm. So if that's a material order or whatever else, like right out of the gate, you can judge demand and have resources going in. Okay. Yeah. Um, drop, and drop, drops are actually terrifying um, because to do a drop, you're essentially banking on the fact that you have demand. Yeah. You are staging a large amount of product. You are doing like some type of marketing push to let people know that that is coming. And then you're just hitting the release. Yeah. And it goes. Yep. Right. It's, in every way, the word drop kind of represents what that is. You're just like, showing up and dropping product like and then yeah you've made the investment whether you're making it or you're uh buying the product or having someone else make it like either the cash or man hours has been put in and then does it pay you're gonna find out like when you hit the 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 publish website button or whatever uh, right does it actually work um and so yeah that there's a like a an intensity to that that i think is pretty alluring the drop thing i it is. Yeah. I actually haven't done a drop drop like in that sense. Uh, everything I've done has generally been like whether it's a pre-order or like sort of a pre-sales or just like I'm making the knives and you can order them right. as I'm making them kind of thing. Like it's usually kind of fluid, not like yep. a sudden instantaneous like eruption of like. Well, and I think you're starting off from a different place, too, which is you the way that you designed your your process allowed you to have an output that was like pretty reasonable um, as you were starting to develop that customer base and like visibility for your product. Mm -hmm. I think I'm on the back or on the other side of that a little bit because for a lot of the products for so long, they weren't available. And so the demand was higher than my output. And that I think is where some of the, the, like, that's where lotteries come from. That's where auctions come from. Um, the drop is, is a kind of a, I feel like a variation on that, which is you've gotten to like, say you're, you're doing a product that you're lotterying consistently, Mm -hmm. right? The real reason behind lotteries is to give people a chance Um, it's, you're, you're slowing down the game, right? Like you're Mm -hmm. giving, you're giving a larger audience a chance to kind of like pull a piece Mm -hmm. drop is a different model, but I feel like it's, it's similar in that you are, you're giving some notification time, the time, like it becomes its own de facto lottery. You're like, well, I'm working. I'm not going to like, I'm missing this drop. I'm on the other side of the pond. Um, the timing is bad, Mm -hmm. but it, but essentially it's like, the ability to, to release a product that is in demand allows for efficiency in the project planning, the marketing, the shipping, kind of everything all at once. Mm -hmm. It allows you to do a large amount of work in a small amount of time. Yeah. Right. 
Um, I was trying to think like, I think culturally a, a lot of like in, in the knife industry drops are more common now. Right. But I think that it came from primarily like streetwear, mm-hmm. um, and like, like Nike dropping like dunks yeah. and shoes. Stuff. Yeah. yeah. Shoes. People were used to it. Like you're waiting for the collection to drop. It drops. All it really was, was a sale. That's, that's the crazy part of it, right? Like at its base, all a drop is, is someone loading product onto their website. Yeah. And how it's many times like, a day does that happen for companies? It's almost like how much demand is there for that product is what yes. makes it a drop or not. Because yes. if you launch a new product and you're a new company and you have a lot of units and you don't have the, uh, that many customers, it doesn't really feel like a drop anymore because it's not like a race to get them. Exactly. You're, that's just a, that you're just releasing product. And so that really is, I guess the, the, the difference, which is demand. So demand, mm-hmm. yeah. demand makes a drop versus just a restock. Yeah. 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 Right. And then another thing about it too, is like demand kind of indicates like my per- current business model is like, you can go on my website right now and like order. I have three knives right now that you can buy that I make you can buy all three right now. Like you could add all three. One of them would be a pre-order and it would just be a deposit, but right. you could buy the three and then I would then have to uh, build it for you. But I have inventory on like a lot of the components. So I'd be like right. custom building it. I don't know that I can sustainably do that forever because in, a, in an ideal world, if my demand continues to grow, it might be possible that I can't just leave that open all the time oh, without 100%, 100%. getting myself buried to the point where people are ordering knives that'll never be made in a reasonable amount of time. I mean, look at, look at like Chris Reeve. Mm-hmm. That's like a prime example, beautiful American made product, like knife maker origin. Like at some point you could probably go on the website and buy a knife. I don't know that for sure, but I feel like there was probably some intersection of production capacity and demand that allowed for that. Yeah. Now there's a six year backlog. Yep. So what, I mean, from a customer standpoint, it's a really interesting proposition because like if I think if I was on the buying side, I would probably, I would be looking for brands where I felt like the value was there, but the hype was not, mm-hmm. which is really, cause, and they exist. Like you walk around blade show and you see like beautiful custom knives that you can walk up to the table and buy mm-hmm. in five years. A lot of those guys, that's not going to be the case. Yeah. Right. Yeah, for sure. And that, that kind of leads into the conversation about like managing the demand. Cause we're, we're kind of getting to is like demand seems to control the methodology right. for sales. Right. And it's like, you can, as far as demand goes, like, for example, I could, if, if demand starts to exceed what I can make in my shop, like I could try to scale up, I could do like everything I could to maintain my current model of having the website open, or I could focus on improving my one man shop process and change the sales right. model and use like the pent up demand as like an asset. Right. Um, and so there's, there's ways to approach that. Like, do you try to always exceed demand? Do you try to always stay just under it? Um, right. but like it's shoot supply demand. Like it's, I think generic. a lot of it is actually really organic. Mm-hmm. Um, this, this to me is why on the small side of manufacturing, I actually don't make a huge, uh, like a, or like, I don't think there's a huge difference between what people consider custom and what people consider production if it's coming out of a small shop, Mm -hmm. right? And a lot of it comes down to like, okay, it's the idea of like making more of something. Our time is still finite. Like, yeah, you can scale up, you can increase production. That's not always like a soul maker's main priority or desire. Mm -hmm. They might not be interested in that, right? So- Mm -hmm even though we have products that kind of would fall under like a production methodology, I don't want to spend all my time doing them. Mm -hmm. So it's not that I'm intentionally limiting product. It's just that I don't want to make Cypops every day, all day. Yeah. Yeah, So I make, I make batches of Cypops and I put them on the website or we do a lottery in our Facebook group. And I think that that like, look like where you're at now, right? So the Overland might be a great example. Right now you're in this full production cycle. As you're moving into the Confidant, you may see like, I don't want to, these orders are still coming in, 
But instead of addressing those orders, I'm actually just going to build a batch. I know people want them. I don't have the time for the back and forth right now. I'm going to build a batch. And all of a sudden, you are potentially doing a drop. I say drop and not restock because at that point, you know that you have the demand for the model. And you're it's not just going to like be put on the website and sit for two months and sell through, right. which there is also like, this is something I struggle with. Like it's actually great to have product on a website that people can order. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it's actually a flaw in my system. I feel like that I have, there's not like certain types of evergreen products that someone could just go on the website and purchase. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we're like working on that in different ways, but yeah. Yeah. That, the the supply demand curve and how they intersect is is kind of there's it's kind of fun to think about in a lot of ways and it, yep. it honestly is such an important thing because it's like if you meet and exceed demand your market presence is different yes than if you are always under the demand right. um it it changes the way that you're viewed um right. for better or worse right. and it's something to consider so it's not just about how the money flows to you it's also like perception Right. Um, and so managing that, because it's like, what if you don't want to be recognized as a person who does X or Y? You know, what if you right. want to be like the the blue collar? Every man's like, just show up and buy it. Swiss Army Victorinox knife, every right. Walmart, you know, or is it like. Is are you trying to preserve like a sense of uniqueness where it's like, yeah, you can't just buy it in every place. Right. You know? We we always say. Inclusive exclusivity. So Mm -hmm. my goal is to have a high-end exclusive product, but I want to include as many people in that as possible. And Mm -hmm. and I get, I get it. It's like a double negative, but the, it's the idea of building community, but like we're small enough that, yeah, not everything is available all the time. Mm -hmm. Right. And I don't, sometimes I don't even know like what the thing is that's going to be the highest demand. Like we know that if we do Cypops, that is a high demand product. Right. Mm-hmm. I have waited for years and years for the, the demand to fade. We just crossed a decade, right? No, sorry. Uh, a decade next year is a decade of the Cypop. Mm-hmm. At some point, I'm sure it'll fade. But it, at this point, it's like minor care and feeding. There's a really nice community around it. And so that as like a product has been able to stand that test. Like funny, like sounds corny, but like the drop test, mm-hmm. right? You drop it. It doesn't sit mm-hmm. like, yeah, it's an interesting there. I think there's like the pro and con from a business development standpoint is also very real. And I think it appeals to, two, to two different types of customer, mm-hmm. right? Some people want to buy the product that they want. They have the money. They want the product. Some people actually really enjoy the hunt. Yeah. Yeah. There's the something very fun about the pursuit of a product, a specific thing. And man, that's just like human nature. Like you're a hunter. Mm-hmm. Like you can go to the store and like buy a back strap. Yeah. Like right. doesn't do the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. No doubt. And that's like some people talk about car shopping being stressful, but I kind of enjoy it because it's like there's right. so many configurations that, for example, I have a Jeep Wrangler, but like when I was shopping for, I had a very specific set of things I was looking for. And it's like, it's like an addiction to, sh- to search. Right. And it was almost like a disappointment when I finally had it. I love the thing, but like, right. is that that search was over. Right. And it's like, you know, that that's like the, any, any product or sphere or activity that you're interested in, like searching for the next thing, like there's a, an right. enjoyment in that. Yep. And so like, if, if they were all, you know, if things that you want are just available, it's, it takes away the, that fun factor. Agreed. This is, this is actually super fun because this is like getting into the weeds and I love it. I mean, it's, that's knife shows in general, right? Like the value of a knife show, like you can go and buy product, but the fact that you're at the show spending time with people, like that's the value of the show. Like you're maybe traveling somewhere new. Mm -hmm. My favorite collectors over the years, there's a few couples that I have like very fond memories of husband and wife. And they're just like at the show. Some of them, both, both like husband and wife are super into it. Some it's like just the husband, right? But a lot of them, it's not their only type of show. So they do this process and like, 
it's maybe a different, you know, pick any collector field Mm -hmm. antiques or something. Right. And they're Mm -hmm. going to that after they go to blade show. Yeah. I started noticing it right when I got married and it was just like one of those things where I was like, man, these, these couples have like these great relationships and it's kind of like this, this like product based hunt obviously isn't the reason, but it like plays into like yeah. what I saw as like a healthy relationship, which was, I don't know, shared interests yeah. and like, I was just really, really cool. Well, and, and it also touches on like the community side of it too, because when it's 100%. like, when it's a little bit of like a, uh, I don't want to say frenzy because that sounds negative, but it's like, if it's a, if it's a lot of people like pursuing similar goals, obviously yep. they're going to start to relate to each other. And you see it in, in all kinds of scenes, like the firearm industry, like I said, the car industry, yep. just people seeking, you know, even in like used markets, you know, you hear about the secondhand knife market. It's like, look right. what I, you know, a guy sold me this, I traded this, Right. I, I feel like I traded up, like, isn't that awesome? Yep. You know, like all this kind of communication that happens in that social sphere of, of knife buying. And that's why right. I like the knife industry a lot is it's certain types of products that have like an enthusiast culture around them that kind of create these types of environments yeah. and knives are one of those things and why it's so attractive to me. And, uh, and that's something that if you're selling knives, like for me, it's something that I've wanted to pay attention to is like, what's the, what is to, to coin, well, not to coin a term, but to use a term that Jeff Bezos has always said is like the customer experience is like the number one concern for them. Right. Um, and it's like that, that, has a lot of wisdom in it because it's like, what is the, what's the fun part about buying a knife for me? Obviously I want the knife to be the absolute pinnacle of what I can possibly produce design manufacturing wise. I want to impress them in every way with the product, but what is the experience of arriving at that product? You know, are there, are there friction points and are those friction points kind of like actually entertaining or is it just annoying? I mean, there, there you go right there, right? Which is the, the method of sales can actually be an indicator of the type of brand that you are yes, and the type of customer that you attract. Mm -hmm. Our goal has always been to have diversification. Um, and that was, that's like one of the main reasons for factory collaborations early on the beauty of like, I realized that I make a knife that a lot of people just either cannot afford or would choose to spend their money elsewhere. Right. Mm Mm-hmm that's completely fine. Like they, you know, always hear that old adage that like, if you don't understand the price of something, it's not for you. Mm-hmm. I actually think that they miss, it misses the fact that it goes both ways, right? Like for some customers, a, pr- a project, a product can be too expensive, but for a lot of customers, a product can be too cheap. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So hitting those, hitting those different points in those different customer bases I just, I don't know. It makes the businesses more interesting. Yeah. Sales are the exact same way. Like you cannot do a sale in a way that makes everyone happy. Right. I had an interesting conversation in the airport uh, leaving Kentucky. Um, I was talking with a maker about, um, I asked him if he did open bids. And he said he didn't do open bids because he didn't want to take advantage of his customers. And I thought it was such an interesting thought process on that because like we have collectors that ask us to do open bids. Mm -hmm. It's just, it might just be a completely different customer base. Yeah. But it really, it like made me think, I was like, huh, I've never ever looked at that in that way. And I could see, I guess I could see how someone does, but it was like, it's such a foreign kind of concept. Well, you've got like, you know, there's, there's people that have different resources when they, when they want something, you know, there's people that like for say a custom Burnley or something like they may have saved up for a couple of years, like putting that, you know, the money in the jar, getting ready to buy it. And they're going to be, you know, kind of strategic about buying. Like they're going to, they're going to be the fastest one to to jump on the drop. They're going to be the first one at the show because it's like, they're going to get table price. That's the main goal. It's building, they're building up to this purchase. And, and then there's, there's others where it's like, they have, financial resources to, to pay whatever it takes to get it today. And it's like that you don't want them. You don't want to have them totally competing with each other. It's nice to serve both of those needs. Yep. Well, it's funny. So I just got back from the Kentucky show and I saw there's a, there's a group for it, Facebook group. And somebody had made the comment, like kind of, kind of like making fun of people who sleep 
like, or, or get, line up really early. Mm-hmm. And there's a normal trajectory that you see, which is a lot of collectors first time they'll go and they'll line up super early. You see this at blade, right? Like people line up the night before after a few years, the guard changes, the people change out because either some of those collectors have made friendships with the makers. They have the things that they want or like that initial urgency is kind of gone. But I loved some of the responses because you see it. You're like, no man, the line is actually just like the first part of the meetup. Like Mm -hmm. we all came to this knife show. Like what difference does it make if I'm like sitting outside in a lawn chair, drinking beer and like telling stories and trading product or if I'm like like sitting in, it's like a camping trip, right? Mm -hmm. I love it so much. Yeah. Same here. And for those people, they're paid from a, from like a product standpoint, like in being the first people in the room. So like when we mm-hmm. do shows like this year for Kentucky, I did the first five people in line. I just made them, I made them a, like a poly that was numbered one through five. Uh, if you guys don't know what the poly is, it's just like a little keychain pry bar bottle opener thing. Um, and then I did, a I lasered on like this cool Kentucky logo. Mm-hmm. The only ones I had at the show I didn't charge them. And it was also their placeholder in line. So if there's any kind of rush to the door, at least I know that the first five people that were there, they get the first five things off the table. That's awesome. It's like, it's, it's just, it's a fun way to do it. And from that standpoint, yeah, they're not paying secondary. Yeah. Right. It's and when, cool. when, when I see a, my, my sensation, when I see like all these people, you know, waiting to go into a show, whether it's overnight or the morning of, I, it puts a big smile on my face and that's coming from someone who I've never profited at a show. I've never right. even sold a product at a show. So it's like, it's not like I look at them and get this, you know, grin of like, yeah, they're going to come buy my stuff. It's just, right. it feels like a be- bellwether of the health of the industry. Sometimes I get that feeling totally. of like, wow, like look at the excitement for this. This is what I want to see. You know, I want to see this industry full of happy people, excited people, interested yeah. people people that are that are getting after it and it's just like that's so cool i mean yep. and then there's some people that aren't going to do that and they're going to show yep. up on the second day of the show and just peruse yep and maybe they're going to buy an, uh, an open bid knife or sign up for a lottery whatever i mean yep. it's it's awesome i i agree with you in that i think i think as like an like i have always considered like one of our roles as makers to be like ambassadors for our industry mm-hmm. especially as like production designers too right I see that. I'm like, man, I just want the industry to be excited. Like Mm -hmm. how many jobs are there where like, or, or fields in general where like rabid excitement is not like the primary, like, I don't know, emotion that you would associate with it. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of, that's a lot of what I would consider knives. Like most knife makers are pretty psyched on making knives. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And if you're not like, you need to probably change some stuff up collectors. It's the same thing, man. Like there people are excited. That makes a very cool industry. Yeah, it absolutely does. Ties into the drop ties into the pre-order pre-order. You are ordering a product, maybe new sight unseen, trusting an individual to keep track of that money and then actually deliver on time. And there's, there's also the, from a, from a standpoint of like with my pre-order, I, I, one of the things I've looked at is like, what if I, like you said, built all the things and then had them ready so that they could just buy them whenever they want. Right. And I've like thought about like, what is the, pers- what would the customer feel like with that? It's like, well, some people would be a lot happier because they don't have to right. wait. But then there's, I have thoughts where it's like the knife being at the end of a little bit of a journey is kind of cool. Yep. You know, it's like, there's a story to this knife because it's like, yeah, that, you know, I placed the order. I had to wait, you know, I emailed, he, he said, yeah, it's just coming back from heat treat. It's going to be another week. Like it, there's kind of like a buildup, a suspense. It's just the same thing about like, you see a teaser trailer for like yep. the new avatar movie and it's like a year ahead. And it's like, it's just getting, you know, planting that seed, like of excitement. And just like, yep. it feels like a journey, not, not just like it just showed up. Um, and so there's cons to that because it's like, well, one of the pros is if you, if you're waiting for the knife and there's a, an excitement buildup, and then you have the knife, there's already like an emotional attachment to it. Yep. Um, but on the other hand, like you don't want that emotional t- attachment to be negative if that waiting period is too long or if it's right. like not properly communicated. So it's like if it took longer than they expected, 
you don't want them to have to unpackage a knife and the knife needs to turn their opinion around because they're already right. forming. Like, they're already bummed that they waited so long on it. Yeah. Yeah. You want them to already have an excitement before they even open the box. Right. Um, and so it's like, how do you, how do you manage that situation? That's, and that's just knowing your customer, you know, cause like yeah. we've talked about, there's all kinds of customers. Well, and that's developing, I think that's just good communication and like developing consistency. Uh, it's interesting. So pre-orders for us are usually a little bit, well, I guess there's two reasons we do pre-orders. We will do pre-orders for a new product that we develop that we just have no idea of like what the demand will be. Okay. And we just want to like organically kind of see like, Hey, here's what we're working on. Do you guys like it or not? Right. But that's Mm -hmm. still communication. They're communicating with us, their preference by what they are willing to spend on something new. The other version of a pre-order is that we realize drops can be super frustrating. Lotteries and auctions can all be super frustrating. And we have long time periods where someone will kind of like come into the brand, be excited to get something and then not get it for a long time. Mm -hmm. So like this year, we did a pre-order early in the year for like, I think I want to say it was like a standard brass side pop. So the, the side pops, like I've made them in all these different configurations. The brass one, the goal with that was actually to make sure that like kind of everyone who wanted to get one could get one without like a crazy weight. Mm-hmm. It, we still haven't really hit that, but we did a pre-order this year and it was awesome. And the feedback was awesome. What was crazy is we did a limited pre-order, but we, it was 200, I think 200 pieces. It took the same amount of time, essentially. I think it took 30 seconds to move through those pieces. Mm-hmm. And it, it was such a strange feeling. Cause I'm like, the goal was to increase the timeline, give people a shot. You do it. And it essentially just looked like a drop, even yeah. though it was a pre-order. And so we're, I think we're going to do it again this year. And it's, it's like, there's no, I think for a lot of us, like we don't know the effect certain methods are going to have, or like the outcome. I thought 200, I thought it was basically going to like, they were going to sit there for a little while and then they would sell through. Mm -hmm. That was the goal. So now I have to look at it and say, well, what is like, I can't just leave open it open-ended. I won't Mm -hmm. do that, but I have to make like a calculated guess at like, Hey, what is enough to satisfy a portion of the community to where everyone who wants something can get something? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So yeah, it's like a different, a different reason, but it serves, I think it, yeah, it serves the same end kind of result. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and, and then there's people that would be frustrated that they couldn't get one, but then there's also people that'd be frustrated that they did get one and they had to wait for it. Right. So it's like, so that each way answers to a different set of interests right. or like desires, I guess. Right. And I look, I don't know. I've had people like people get upset when we do a big drop because like they look and they're like, Oh, it's going to affect secondary value as a maker. I think we take secondary value and secondary markets. I think it's a good idea to really take it into, um, just kind of pay attention to it. Right but also not drive your business based on it. It's just Mm -hmm. having care for your collectors. Like I don't want to do anything that if someone is willing to like support me and my brand, I don't want to make a decision that's going to affect like their collection and the way they either value it from like an emotional standpoint or from a monetary standpoint. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, But back to, back to like the factory collab thing, when that first started, I had a bunch of collectors get really upset with me because I was doing like an, a design for a company and an overseas knife and all of these different reasons why this is the most terrible idea in the world. But I saw it as a way to bring more people into the community and more people Mm -hmm. into the brand and then educate those people. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes you just, you actually do need an influx of, of like new blood. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Eyeballs. Yeah. Cause we see brands and makers that, they have their either their supply is so limited and their demand is so high or they have curtailed the what they will do in a certain way that like no one new ever comes into the brand either it's it's so expensive that like their customer base is their customer base but they don't really have like an access point for someone with less money mm-hmm. or or it's only lottery and it never gets purchased i think that i think that 
it makes it more interesting for me to just kind of move around inside of that ecosystem yeah. and, and allow different, like it's, I love selling auction knives. It lets me do sometimes like some of my best work mm-hmm. and, and be compensated for it. Mm-hmm. I don't want to just sell, do, sell auction knives. Yeah. Yeah. There's right? the, in a, in a certain sense, it's like the, the sit, I mean, to go back to it, like the <laughs> process of selling is also part of the product. It is all, like, the, yes, it's part of the process that is the product. And so it's like right. the product that people are buying also includes the process in which they purchased it. Yes. And so it's like, it's exciting to play with the product all across the board, not just from a physical standpoint, but from a, how is well, this is, this standpoint. is game of knife, right? Yeah. And really what it is, I think industries have methods of sales Mm -hmm. that are more common than other methods of sales, right? So like at this point in the knife community, lotteries and auctions are very common. When I first started, like, I don't think I had a lottery for probably seven or eight years because it's nerve wracking. Yeah. Like someone comes up to the table and wants to buy a knife and you'd be like, I'm sorry, you can't buy that knife you have to put a ticket in a bag and then be drawn to buy the knife Mm -hmm. well if you're not selling all of your knives routinely that's like a big gamble yeah yeah. auctions are the same way and yet they're so commonplace at this point that i see new makers doing both yeah like right out of the gate because it's just the method yeah so one thing that i'm always curious about is like okay we have our methods in our industry what what are other industries doing? Yeah. Like, what are the methods of sales that are interesting? Um, one that I've never done that I think is, is like a, it's like a hybrid is the waffle. Do you know mm. about waffles? No. So you can't have a raffle, but you can sell an entry to buy. So when we do a lottery, you're just entering. And if your name gets drawn, you get to, purchase the product at table price. Mm -hmm. A waffle is that you are essentially paying like say $10 and a maker will limit or not the amount of entries Mm -hmm. and you can buy as many entries as you want. That's a really, that's a really interesting method. And so, so like, and then they pay that. So you, you can, you buy into the lottery po- portion of yeah, it and then ten, say $10 and, and, and you, you pay win the table knife. price. No, you win no, the knife, you, you win, win the knife. knife. So the okay. maker is actually making the money on the entries that are coming mm. in yeah. and someone is gambling essentially that they can buy, then well, get the knife. In a sense, that seems like the actual original definition of a raffle, like from the way it's used totally. in a lot of other industries. Like you go, you go see like the, you go to a rodeo and they have like a yep. Ram truck there and they're doing like yep. a raffle. And yep. you're buying entries to get it you're buying for free. entries, right? Yeah. So I've seen people complain about this method. And it's like, well, if you don't like it, don't participate in it. Mm-hmm. Right. But I mean, I entered like an Omaze raffle for a sprinter van because I was like, man, I can 25 bucks and yeah. I win a sprinter van and two hundred thousand dollars. Like, I'm game. And then mm-hmm. a portion of that goes to charity. So I'm like, that's great. Mm-hmm. Right. The only, the only raffle esque thing that we've ever done was side pop for tots. That was how we fundraised, but all mm-hmm. of that money went to, went to toys for tots. So that's like, yeah. that's as close as I've got, but it worked really well. Yeah. Um, because, and I think the, on that level, this kind of ties in with social media in a pretty efficient way, which is if you have one product, there are a lot of people who have $10. Mm-hmm who might really like that product. Yeah. If you're selling $10 waffle tickets, you're essentially giving a lot of people a chance at that thing. Mm -hmm. And I would say that at least from what I can tell most makers, it's like a hybrid lottery auction. So most makers sell more tickets than the price of the product. If it is a priced product, but by like some margin. Mm-hmm. So maybe it's a, maybe they sell a couple hundred dollars more in tickets, seven hundred dollar knife, nine hundred dollars worth of tickets. So mm-hmm. it's it's capped. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, that was kind of that's one that I've seen pop up in the last few years. 
Yeah, no, that's that's a good model. I think another reason for that model is like, like you said, it's it's another customer base you might be accessing because there's individuals that like they love your products, they right. own your CRKT designs or yep. whatever, um, and they would love to own like a custom squid, like right. a you know a high end yep. custom squid, and it's like well they're they're not willing to spend the money even table price which is yep. totally fine and respectable but then if they're they might be willing to put the ten dollars in knowing that it's a a, a gamble you know yeah, to see if gamble. they can pull it out but it's like it adds fun to the experience for them to have the possibility of moving into that next level yep um from their degree of resources or just their degree of willingness to spend right. money yeah, I think I think some of this stuff too is tied to like our brand identities. There's mm-hmm. a lot of things that we do like that I will do in my Facebook group that I wouldn't do on Instagram or on our website because the the Facebook group is the community that has like they they kind of have the knowledge and understand like I I came up with a um a lottery method called luxury lotto. Okay? And it's a hybrid lottery auction. Mm-hmm. So, say I have 10 Cypops and they're all different. Mm-hmm. We will, a lot of times if it's a small drop like that, we'll lottery them in the group. All you have to do is say in, if you win it, you, you get to pick one, right? In usually in order. What the luxury lotto did was say, well, if you really want one, you can make a bid on it. That turns it into an auction, mm. but only for the one piece. Mm-hmm. So if someone is like, Hey, uh, all right. Yeah. I just want that one. I want to pay $400 for it. Yeah. Everyone else who's still in is just in, entered in the lottery. And if, if no one bids against that person, they pay the $400, they're done. They got, they got, they made their own luck in that they, they put a price on something that they were okay with mm-hmm. and then had no competition or luck involved. Yeah. I cannot fathom explaining that on Instagram really. Right, right. People, I mean, it would just be like ridiculous. So it's a sales method that works inside of a community. Yeah. And also it kind of, again, adds to that experience of like, yeah, this was a journey to get this product. Like I had to learn a process and I had to like approach it from a certain angle and have strategy. You have to have a strategy. Literal strategy to just buy a product. And that's, that's exciting. You know, that's fun. I I think that's really cool. Uh, What's next? Like, what what do you think like from a... From a sales standpoint, like here's where we are in the knife industry. So you have go on a website, order a product, uh, go to a show, buy a knife off a maker's table, lottery for a knife, open bit a knife. Mm-hmm. Those are uh, some makers do like really gamified stuff, which is pretty fun. Mm-hmm. Um, again, works for certain customer you, bases. You've got Bussy who, you know, gets on a giant lift and throws cards in the yeah, air. And, yeah. Yeah. If you're like going to play Rochambeau for a knife, like you're going to, you're going to like knock some of your, you know, uninitiated customer base, like out of that running. Yeah. Yeah. So it really is about having a reason for how you sell, I think is the overarching. Yeah, yeah. What would the next variation be? Million dollar question right there. How do we use AI? <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, scavenger hunt. We've done that. That's cool. like a super fun one. Again, like that works for a customer base. And like a lot of, you know, you get people who are like, that's dumb. I'm not going to run around and like try to find things. Mm-hmm. But part of that is actually really fun. If you yeah. like scavenger hunts, like yep. Yep. it's not for you. Yeah. So let me ask you this. Okay. We've we've been talking a lot about in this in a scenario where you have pent up demand, you have a ton of liberty in how you sell it. And you can Correct. that's where you can really inject a lot of these fun things. Yep. But let's let's rewind to a scenario we've both been in, you know, in the early days of like you net you're in a position where you do think that your production is exceeding demand. Yep. What sales tactics do you think fit there? As a knife maker, kind of specifically. Mm-hmm. Like in the, I guess it depends on where you're, you're at in the cycle. Right. Have you already made all the product and you're like, oh man, I made too many knives that I can't sell. Let's, let's say that from a, let's go to the custom side mm-hmm. in a knife show environment. Cause that's like, we can look at that as like grassroots base level. Yeah. Yeah. You show up to the show and you have 50 knives. Okay. I would say that the, 
the standard method for most makers. If if you have if you have a, a demand that is th- making you think that you will sell fifty knives, and on this given Sunday you just the customers that you need aren't there, mm-hmm. I would say going to a dealer. Yeah, is the most common method, mm-hmm. and I would say at that point they're going to go home. They're going to list the knives on their website. The knives are going to sell. You took a gamble at getting full retail. You're going to sell them to a dealer probably at a mm-hmm. discount, but overall that's still a win. Yeah. Adaptive it's, strategy. It's a check down. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then, yeah. you know, and then next time you're like, Oh, I, I think on the custom side, it's really funny because these are, these are some of the conversations that like go on constantly, um, of like, what do you bring to a show? Certain makers have had like, where you're like, Oh, I go to this show and they wanted this. And then I go to this show and they hated that. Like mm-hmm. yeah. you're like, I don't, I don't know that that with social media, I don't know that that's as much of a, of a problem anymore or, mm-hmm. or an occurrence. I think that was a generation or two probably before us. Do you think if you're in the very beginning, you know, you're, you're a fresh new face in the, in the industry, you're doing really good work, you've got the product, but you're still trying to work on building up the customer base yes. and like the excitement around your brand. Do you think it's a good idea to get into the more creative sales tactics right out the gate? Or do you think it's a deterrent if you like overcomplicate it or should it just uh, be table I, price? Me, me personally, me personally, I, I don't like say like pay your dues, but if you on the custom side, if you're going to knife shows, I think there's a lot of value in just going with what you make and selling it. Mm-hmm if the work is speaking for itself and you're doing what you need to be doing, like you will sell the man, this ties in. This is like another like fun, I don't know, digression kind of, but if you, if you look at a maker's table as a construct of like a marketing or a website, a table that is like, in my opinion, and from what I've seen over the years, a table that is like cluttered and like, Un, I don't know, just not, not well thought out mm-hmm. generally will sell less product. So early on for me, my goal was always to have a good representation of my work displayed in a manner that allowed people to connect with it. Mm-hmm. Right. If I had 10 pieces on the table, someone who's walking past v- can visually still lock in on a detail of a knife. If you have a table covered in knives, you don't see, you don't see specifics. Yeah. Right. You also run into like weird stuff like, oh, if you have too many things on your table and someone drops something, the chances of things being damaged. So it's like you create like, it's like photography, right? Like you create Mm. like weight at the bottom of the photo or you create space in the frame. I think that our knives are the same. It's the same kind of process but I saw it as it's like a sales method also, Mm -hmm. which is like clean, attractive, approachable. Right. Okay. So that would be, there's, there's the beginning level, right? Yeah. And it's interesting talking to you about these early days conversations because it's your, your early days were shows, you know, knife shows. And so that's like your perception of starting to sell knives. Whereas like for me, I've made it this far without ever doing that. And so it's like, when I think of like answering the question of, okay, your demand is not there where you want it to be. I just think of like, how do you work the channels of the internet? You know what I mean? Like that's where, that's where my head goes. Um, And so one of the things that I've always said is like, if you're trying, if you have something you're good at and you want more people to know about it, you have to have that thing in front of as many eyeballs as possible as often as possible. It's all about exposure. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of obvious. Like you don't really have to, you know, listen to this podcast to know that, but it it's in my early days, like the biggest goal of mine was to expose my work to as many people as possible. And mainly that at that time it was like Instagram and Facebook, like 2012. Right. And so it's like this, things are changing, but like you do have to know what's changing and what, like where are people's eyeballs today? Um, and I think that it, it, you, it's like what, uh, you see floating around sometimes is that like all creators and like designers and artists nowadays have also had to become influencers in right. a sense to in like, sense, in, yeah. to, to show off their own product. And I, I, I think it's absolutely true. 
Yeah. Um, and it's like, you just have to, you have to show what you got. And it's right. like, it's whether it's at a show or on Facebook or Instagram, like I, in the early days of like Instagram and Facebook, when I had stuff early, early days, it was pencil art. Like I, before I was making knives, it was all drawings of cars actually. And I was selling physical drawings of cars. And I would like take, like I draw a picture of a Mustang. And I think I mentioned this on another podcast, but I, I would pay pages on Facebook to repost it. And it was mm-hmm. like, just, just getting eyeballs. And I was literally like, I would sell the drawing, take the cash, pay another page. And it would be like Mustang lovers on Facebook back when pages were a little bit different structure, yep. but it'd be like Mustang page. And I'd pay him like 60 bucks to post this. And then I would get a bunch of followers and then I would just keep recycling that. And I did the same thing on Instagram. I'd pay like different, not different pages that had like good audiences that I thought resonated with what I was doing. And it was like I was paying for advertising, but even if I didn't have anything to sell, I just needed my own audience and I had to access other audiences to get there, you know, and I can't stress that enough of like, you need a volume of eyeballs that are right. interested in your work. And then right. you, that's where the creativity comes in is like, okay, now you have the demand. You're starting to build that. Where do you go from there? Um, and I think the modern era of like the influencer world, like you, you love it or hate it for better or worse, but like, it's just, it's but become it a necessity. Yeah. Well, okay. Let me, let me like go in like back into your original question, right? Cause I want to like stretch it out from table mm-hmm. game. So we'll go into your early days because imagine this. So your customer was actually different at that point. Cause your customer was a company. Mm-hmm. You were essentially, this was when you were making, when you're designing knives, but not making your own knives. So you are going to companies and they are, you're collaborating with a company. You're mm-hmm. pitching designs early on, you're pitching designs and maybe not having collaborations happen. Mm-hmm. So at that point, you could have also essentially made too much product. Yeah. You could have designed too many things for too many companies potentially and flooded. Yeah. So you didn't have to fix that problem, but like, what would the fix have been from that standpoint? Cause it's like, yeah. Yeah. Right? Well, like, in, yeah. And that's where our stories are different is like, by the time I came around to making a lot more of my own product, I had kind of amassed like a decade worth of people that were aware of my work through like of, these yeah. other channels. And that, that is a testament to the value of things like designing for CRKT and whatnot is like, that's another audience that it, like you said, when you designed for squid for CRKT, like that's yeah. another audience. It's another right. expansion of the, of the volume of customers. And it's like, I didn't, by the time I started making knives, which is only two years ago in volume, like I am right. now, I had an audience already. And so yeah. I had to tap into that. Um, and so, yeah, you're right in that, like, I had a, a weird kind of backwards way of coming at it. And so what would the, had I not had the eight years in the knife industry prior to that, what would the answer have been? No, and, I was, I mean, I was even thinking about it from like, just from process standpoint, right. Of like, I guess, I guess like my answer that I came up in my head, which was like, what do you do if you overproduce? It's like, well, it literally just stop. Mm -hmm. So if you had gotten to a point where you were like, man, I've submitted too many designs and there's all this stuff like the only solve really is to just stop doing that. And then like maybe focus, change your focus slightly. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I would make the argument. So going from knife show to like online sales. Right. I would say that for most people, the process would actually be the same. If you did too many, you would then reach out to a dealer. Mm-hmm. what's crazy is that relationship may have just been built at the show. So it's like mm-hmm. an extension of relationships that you've already built. And that is, that's like small industry networking at its finest. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, yeah. That word networking, bingo it's networking, right. Community bingo. back to community. Yep. So, I mean, because, okay, if we take it to now where you have product, right. So say you make too much, too much product. So what are the, what are the common methods? So we already illustrated, you could take it to a dealer. Yep. You could put it on sale. Yep. Right. There's, Which I would guess most of us do not want to put anything on sale. Yeah. Dis discounting should be avoided. I mean, I think personally, if you've made your product and you priced it a certain way so that you yes. can make a living, if you start discounting it, a, you are possibly becoming not very profitable at that point. Right. And then 
secondly, and probably most importantly, is the relationship with the customer is affected yes. by that in negative ways in that they you don't want to train a customer base that they shouldn't buy your product until it's discounted. Yes. And, and things like that. There's yeah. like negative, you know, after effects. Well, and some of it too, like some of it is just, this is the, we're small companies. Like this is the, pr- this is what it costs. This is the mm-hmm. price that we put on it. Mm-hmm. Like Black Friday does not mean the same thing to most small makers. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to put my product on sale. I might have a special product or do something fun to like capitalize on the, on like the, the hustle and bustle of that day. But it's not going to be like deep discount. Yeah. You know? And that touches on a point. If you set a price that you need to make to make money, be confident and own that price. And this is something my dad talks about all the time. It's like when you tell someone a price, if you come across as insecure about the price, like you're worried they think it's too high, yep. it devalues your product and their perception Absolutely. because they're like, they don't even think their product is worth that much. Why should I think that? Yeah. So it's like it once you get that price in mind, like that you need to make to to exist, to make a living, to you know, to eat, you have to be a hundred percent confident that you've done the homework and the work and that knife is worth that amount of money. Right. Or whatever it might be. And it's like you have to convey that to the customer that you are confident in your pricing. And if you're not confident in your pricing, then no one will be. And that's a problem. Yeah. I think having reasons behind pricing back to the custom side, um, it will like we used to joke about arbitrary art pricing. Mm. Like, I feel like this knife looks like it should cost that much. Mm. I started doing options and pricing the options. So it's like, here's the base price for a knife. Here's what a zirconium backspacer costs. Here's what a hand drill blade costs. Um, this is more, I guess this is more like tribal knowledge stuff, but like earlier in custom knives, like you heard about makers who would have different prices for different collectors because they knew who they were. Mm. That to me is like insanity. Mm -hmm. It's so, it's such a like dishonest. Yeah. The customer experience of sales. And if you are that customer and you find out like, and he bumped the price by $200 because like my bankroll's solid. Yeah. I would never buy from that maker ever again. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, I just, I was like, man, I just want, I want to be, if someone asked me like, Hey, why is this knife? $800 $800 more than this one. It's the same model. It's like, well, because it, I spent, you know, four hours hand carving that mm-hmm. like, here's that price, mm-hmm. you know? Yep. Yeah. Transparency. And, right? and again, so, it, being able to justify prices is one thing, but at the, on the other hand, you shouldn't lead into any conversation, conversation about the price with the like immediate, like, you're explaining yourself. Yeah. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Like it's, it's, it's a, uh, yeah, I'm asking $800. And, and the reason is you, you don't need to explain yourself. You just need to say the price. Yeah. But there should be an understanding of like, well, this is where the value comes from, but I'm not going right. to lead with that. Right. Yeah. I'm just going to ask. Yeah. Because right. you, you don't want, you want, you don't want to feel like you're justifying yourself to people because it's like, right. it should be justifiable that the knives are here that you boxed them up and you flew to Atlanta and you put them on the table. Like that takes a lot of energy. That should be enough justification for you to charge what you need to charge. Yep. Well, that's an interesting kind of sideline too, which is some of these things kind of from an explanation point. Like if you go to a knife show and you meet the maker and you're like looking at the product and asking questions, you're able to make judgments around the value based on this interaction. Mm -hmm. Social media at this point, we we essentially have to explain the value through a passive method. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I mean, like great example that is fresh in my mind would be like that. I did an open bid Cypop for Kentucky. It was like bamboo. It was more jewelry-esque. Like, I, I, you know, I like sweated on silver and like made this coin and all this stuff. And I documented the process. Mm-hmm. So showing the process... I see where this is going right now. The process is the product. (laughs) Like that was what came out of it. If -hmm. you didn't see the process going into it, the, for me, the value of the product wouldn't have been as great because you just don't understand like, Oh, this is crazy. Like this is how this thing is made. Mm -hmm. So I guess like, I think a lot of this probably is just been going on forever. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It applies to all things you know, 600 years ago in some market somewhere, 
Like yeah. it's the same thing as now. Yeah. The the these methods, beats are, are blue, not red. They came from three yeah. three counties yeah. over or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that is like, man. I don't know. I'm very this conversation has got me kind of like fired up on like a futurist thought process of what sales looks like moving forward. I did think of one one variation that I've seen also which I think there is now an app that is like kind of auction based but like very plug and play. And I Mm. think it was geared maybe to creatives. So, I mean, that would be a perfect extension of some of these conversations, you know, for sure. Like processes. So, okay. And back to the original two. Go ahead. All right. I don't want to, I want, I want that final thought. Yeah. I I was just going to say like, like you said, if you're broadcasting your process. Yeah to the, the, you don't have to explain yourself at all when it comes to the price. And that's, yeah. I think what you were basically just saying. And it's like, yeah. that's where, that's why you want to show off your process. That's why the process right. is the product. And that's why we are believers in that phrase is because the process is what they're buying. And if you show them what it is, they'll understand why it costs what it costs. And then you don't have to explain it like in a literal sense, like, you know, giving, you know, at a show, you're not sitting here like, bobbling over words trying to give them a reason why it costs eight hundred dollars or whatever yeah. they should argue. and that i think a lot of that is actually just goes back to the very beginning of the conversation which is what it what and why is your method of sales so your why mm-hmm. can you know you have to understand i think why you're doing something why it fits with your brand yeah. why it fits with your customer base and if it doesn't and it's something that you want to develop figuring out how to educate around that process, create value yeah. around that process. And, and in some ways, my goal is like, I want them to know so much about my process that they're surprised at how little it costs. Yeah. You know what you're, I mean? Like you're, that's honestly, win. you're doing an amazing job of just that. Like I, I, I consistently have told you that I feel like your the, what you are making could have a higher price tag and just be like very fair still. So mm-hmm. it's pretty cool. I appreciate it. Uh, I just had a weird thought. If anyone ever made a drinking game around this show and the process is the product, it would be a bad, dangerous drinking game. Yeah. Yeah. Be careful with that. (laughs) Bud Light, not like any heavy beers. This is a a 4.5%. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, man. So that's like a pretty fun one. I'm curious, like you right now, I feel like our sales methods for the most part are, are pretty they're pretty consistent. And I think that they will stay probably pretty consistent at this point for you. It sounds like you actually have quite a few variations of sales methods to kind of like see what fits with your brand Mm -hmm. and customer base Mm -hmm. and your business. Like, and it seems like externally some variation on stocked product, AKA the drop is, is the next one that you would kind of do. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, being that that is also, that's like the closest variation in online sales to showing up to a knife show and putting your product on the table. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That I I'm prototyping the process for making the knives and I'm prototyping the process for selling the knives for selling at the same time. And it's not in its final form. I'm still learning. So I think we, I mean, we all are. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I would like to do more research on, kind of like, I don't know, parallel industries and how they sell. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess like just off the top of my head, like jewelry seems like it might be like a comparable. A a quick uh, side note. My dad is a custom saddle maker and he does uh, high end stuff, which actually is kind of parallel to the high end knives. He does a a big show every year where he's in a group. It's you can, you can uh, kind of compare his group to like the, uh, the knife makers guild or, okay. you know, like, uh, the high end forge guys, like how they have their, their kind of independent or, shows, yeah, ABS, yeah. like they have this show down in Oklahoma city every year and they kind of bring their like best of the best, like the best piece they can come up with. Um, it's a group of rawhide braiders, bitten spur makers, saddle makers, and there's one other, I don't remember, but anyway, they, they come together and they, the way they do the sale is, they price all the 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 
you know, things that they've made. They put it in a catalog. People see the catalog before they come to the show, knowing what the price is and what they are with like high fidelity photography. And they, the catalog has become like a collector's piece. I love it so much. And they, so they show up, they get a booklet with like tags and they put the tags of the, it's a lottery system. So they put the tags in the things that they want. And then at the end of the show, they have a big board and they draw for each thing and they draw like four names for each. And so like you can look at all the things that you're drawn for. Mm -hmm. And if you're like the second in line on this one, if the guy also drew for another thing that he preferred, he can opt out of this one and buy that one. And then you move up to the number one spot on that other thing. And that's so you a can really s- unique. I like the, I yeah. like the, that's similar. I mean, like for us, that would be like tactical invitational has yeah. kind of a similar method. The catalog idea that makes it feel really special. Yeah. I love that. And the yeah. fact that, like you said, it's a basically now a collectible. Yeah. And there's people um, that literally have like a bookshelf with just like right. 2008, 2009, all the way up, you know, like 20 that's years so of catalogs. Cool. That and goes so, into a whole, that goes into like a whole different topic for me, which is like creating collectability like outside mm-hmm. of your primary products. Yeah. So like think Coca-Cola. Yeah. Right. And have to, it'd have to be a smaller group. I mean, like it'd have to Man. be a pretty tight knit show yes. because I mean, we're talking like the TCAA is the group that my dad's a part of and it's like shoot active members. It's probably, I don't know exactly like 20 members or something. And so you're only looking at like 30, 40 pieces total in the whole show. Right. Um, and so it's like a, a succinct catalog, like whereas if it, the show was enormous, like the logistics of that would be pretty difficult. And this is like the highest level work, essentially. Yeah, so it's a peak. This is this is. I mean, if we're talking, we're talking utilitarian items made in such an elevated way. Yeah, I mean, right? there's which been, is custom knives a lot of times. There's been like saddles over six figures sold there, yeah, and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. Oh man, I love it so much. Cool. That I think I feel like that is kind of like the perfect wrap for this show, which is parallel industry. And a method that I actually, I hadn't like, I hadn't heard of that before. Yeah. feels like a combination of like high end antique show, like, or like slash like Christie's auction where you're getting yeah. like a catalog. The catalog is what makes it the special. The catalog is what I makes think. it special. Because if in, in the knife industry, there's nothing like that. Because you get like the post blade show blade magazine where they'll yeah. have a bunch of photos, but it's after the fact. Oh, I love it um, so much. Yeah. If you preempt it. But the, the only struggle with that is like the product has to be done like six weeks before the show or like a month. Which uh, I love. That sh- I mean, that that's actually when you said it, the yeah. first thought was like, wow, that is so anti knife maker. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, exactly. You are not finishing things at two o'clock in the morning before well, you and, take off. Well, but that's what my dad does, but he has to ship it by a certain date down to the, right. it's a museum where they do it. So the, yeah. the pieces are actually on display for like a period of time before the sale Yep. in a museum. So it's like a museum ex- exhibit literally. Yep. And then it becomes a sale and you can get the catalog. So it's, it's pretty cool. Funny. My only experience with that type of, I guess, just timeline was we, we did the um, basically a solo exhibition on Cape Cod last year. And the mm-hmm. show was called Convergent. Yeah, was Super awesome. fun. But it was a gallery show. Um, and that is, that's exactly what I had to do because the work had to go. It had to be staged. Um, that'll give us a fun, I'm working on something for for next year. That'll be a fun tie into that thought process. Nice. But dude, I think we should, I think we should wrap it, um, yeah. drop pre-order. It's pretty fun. We both got them going on right now. Yeah. Um, and yeah, cool. Yeah. Hopefully this podcast is perhaps part of the journey for being a customer <laughs> of ours someday. So, yeah. Hopefully we're trying, to, trying to make that exciting, I guess. There's some I distillation know. of, yeah. yeah, a lot of, <laughs> a lot of banging the head on the desk. <laughs> right. Well, thanks guys. So, Appreciate you guys. Yep. Follow us on Instagram and go ahead and comment and let us know what you think and all yep. that good stuff. We need to set up an email address so people can like email us questions. Oh, stuff. I do have one. Uh, nice. It's uh, edgeandflowpod at Gmail. Perfect. So I've never even Drop used us that an publicly. email. Let us know if there's topics you guys want to hear. Yeah. Um, we are in the process of figuring out what this podcast is and where it's going. So yep. we're always open to feedback. Thank you guys. Talk to you soon. Peace. Later, man.